One bright morning towards the end of August, I waved goodbye to Gandhiji. He was carried away to the Arabian Sea in the far west. That was my last glimpse of him for two years. Gandhiji had gone to London as the sole representative of the Congress. Mrs. Sarojini Naidu also attended the round table conference as a representative of Indian womanhood. The gulf between the Congress viewpoint and that of the British government was immense. We were not joining the round table conference to talk interminably about the petty details of a constitution. The real question was how much power was to be transferred to a democratic India. What was Gandhiji's idea of India, which he was setting up to his own wishes and ideas? I shall work for India in which the poorest shall feel that it is their country in whose making they have an effective voice. An India in which there shall be no high class and low class of people. An India in which all communities will live in perfect harmony. There can be no room in such an India for the curse of untouchability or the curse of intoxicating drinks and drugs. Women will enjoy the same rights as men. This is the India of my dreams. <laughs> the members of the round table conference had been nominated by the British government. They represented groups of vested interests in India who were tied up with British imperialism and looked to it for protection. The scales were terribly loaded against us. We watched the proceedings with amazement and ever-growing disgust. In the gilded, crowded hall, Gandhiji sat a very lonely figure. His dress, or absence of it, distinguished him from all others, but there was an even vaster difference between his thought and outlook and that of the well-dressed folk around him. His was an extraordinary position. In that conference, we wondered from afar how he could tolerate it. The British government had, however, no intention of falling in with our wishes in the matter. It was constituted so as to fail. Whatever the result of the mission that brought me to London, I know that I shall carry with me the pleasantest memories of my stay in the midst of the poor people of East London. Two days after our arrest, Gandhiji landed in Bombay. January the 4th, 1932, was a notable day. It put a stop to argument and discussion. Early that morning, Gandhiji and the Congress President, Vallabhai Patel, were arrested and confined without trial as state prisoners. Civil liberty ceased to exist. It was a declaration of a kind of state of siege for the whole of India. On that 4th of January also, our trial took place in Nani prison. I was sentenced to two years rigorous imprisonment. So we sat in Nani prison, cut off from the strife and yet wrapped up in it in a hundred ways. We were out of it, yet in it. In Allahabad, my mother was in a procession which was stopped by the police and later charged with lathis. My mother was knocked down and was hit repeatedly on the head. When the news of this came to me, the thought of my frail old mother lying bleeding on the dusty road obsessed me. And I wondered how I would have behaved if I had been there. How far would my non-violent feelings have carried me? Our 
our peaceful and monotonous routine in jail was suddenly upset in the middle of September 1932 by a bombshell. News came that Gandhiji had decided to fast unto death in disapproval of the separate electorate given by Ramsay MacDonald's communal award to the depressed classes. What a capacity he had to give shocks to people. If Babu died, what would India be like then? And how would politics run? There seemed to be a decay and dismal future ahead, and despair seized my heart when I thought of it. And then a strange thing happened to me. I had quite an emotional crisis, and at the end of it, I felt calmer, and the future seemed not so dark. And even if Bapu died, our struggle for freedom would go on. I have come across a sonnet on the Buddha that I like. Strange how Buddha appeals to me. Buddha, Marx, Gandhi. A strange medley. Almora was perched up on a ridge. I could just see over the enclosing walls the top of a mountain a mile or so away dotted with clouds. Wonderful shapes these clouds assumed and I never grew tired of watching them. Sometimes they would join together and look like a mighty ocean and the rustling of the breeze through the deodars would sound like the coming in of the tide on a distant seafront. Sometimes a cloud would advance boldly upon us, seemingly solid and compact, and then dissolve in mist as it came near and finally enveloped us. I have spent in prison sitting alone, wrapped in my thoughts. How many seasons I have seen go by, following each other into oblivion. How many yesterdays of my youth lie buried there. And sometimes I see the ghosts of these dead yesterdays rise up, bringing poignant memories and whispering to me, was it worthwhile? There is no hesitation about the answer. I was worried by the ups and downs of Kamala's condition. In May last, she left for further treatment in Europe. On September the 4th, 1935, I was suddenly discharged from Almora jail as news had come that my wife's condition was critical. There was the same old brave smile on Kamala's face when I saw her. But she was too weak and too much in the grip of pain. The crisis continued and slowly drained the life out of her. Sometimes we talked a little of old times. I thought of the early years of our marriage when with all my tremendous liking for Kamala, I almost forgot her. For then, I was like a person possessed, giving myself utterly to the cause I had espoused. And yet I was far from forgetting her, and I came back to her again and again, as to a sure haven. A hundred pictures of Kamala succeeded each other in my mind. A hundred
hundred aspects of her rich and deep personality. She wanted to play her own part in the national struggle and not by merely being a hanger-on and a shadow of her husband. She wanted to justify herself to her own self as well as to the world. Nothing in the world would have pleased me more than this, but I was far too busy to see below the surface and I was blind to what she looked for and so ardently desired. Yet always there was a certain magic in our relationship. On her inexperienced shoulders fell that task of organizing our work in the city of Allahabad when every known worker was in prison. She made up for that inexperience by her fire and energy and within a few months she became the pride of Allahabad. Winter had come. As Christmas approached, there was a marked deterioration in Kamla's condition. Early on the morning of February the 28th, she breathed her last. My wife's death in Switzerland ended a chapter of my existence and took away from my life something that had been a part of my being. It was difficult for me to realize that she was no more and I could not adjust myself easily. Mother's death later broke the final link with the past. I returned to India and plunged into my work. Within a few days of my return, I had to preside over the annual session of the National Congress. convinced that the only key to the solution of the world's problem and of India's problem lies in socialism. Socialism is however something even more than an economic doctrine. It is a philosophy of life and as such also it appeals to me. But I realize that the majority in the Congress as it is constituted today may not be prepared to go thus far. I am advocating socialism and want to make the people understand the doctrine now so that when political power does come it may not be captured by the fascists. Some kind of a dream of unity has occupied the mind of India since the dawn of civilization. India was, it must be remembered, a country of many religions, in spite of the dominance of the Hindu faith in its various shapes and forms. Islam was to come to India both as a religious and political force. There were many Muslims in the Congress. Their numbers were large and included many able men. Most dynamic were the Ali brothers, Dr. M. A. Ansari, Maulana Abul Kalam Azad. So also, on a more moderate scale, Mr. M. A. Jinnah. He had left the Congress when the organization had taken a political leap forward. The Muslim League was started in 1906 with British encouragement in order to keep away the new generation of Muslims from the National Congress. Of course, British governments in the past and the present have based their policy on creating division in our ranks. Divide and rule has always been the way of empires. We cannot complain of this, or at any rate, we ought not to be surprised by it. To ignore it 
and not to provide against it is in itself a mistake in one's thought. The want of clear ideals and objectives in our struggle for freedom undoubtedly helped the spread of communalism. Mr. Jinnah was able, tenacious, and not open to the lure of office. His position in the Muslim League, therefore, became unique, and he was able to command the respect which was denied to many others prominent in the League. When I was Congress President, I wrote to Mr. Jinnah on several occasions and requested him to tell us exactly what he would like us to do. I asked him what the League wanted and what its definite objectives were. Mr. Jinnah's demand was based on a new theory he had recently propounded that India consisted of two nations, Hindus and Muslims. I wrote to him, why only two nations? For if nationality was based on religion, then there were many nations in India. The time has gone by when religious groups as such can take part in political or economic struggles. That may have been the case in medieval times. It is inconceivable today. The lines of cleavage are different. They are economic. Therefore, to think in terms of communal groups functioning politically is to think in terms of medievalism. From Jinnah's two-nation theory, developed the conception of Pakistan or splitting up of India. The British Parliament passed a Government of India Act in 1935. This provided for some kind of a provincial autonomy, but there were so many reservations and checks that both political and economic power continued to be concentrated in the hands of the British government. The Congress could not possibly accept the Act of 1935 as even a temporary solution of the Indian problem. It was pledged to independence and to combat the Act. Yet a majority had decided to work provincial autonomy. It had thus a dual policy, to carry on the struggle for independence and at the same time to carry through the legislatures constructive measures of reform. The agrarian question especially demanded immediate attention. In spite of our rejection of the Constitution, we decided to contest elections, as this brought us into intimate touch not only with the millions of voters, but also others. Towards the end of 1936 and in the early months of 1937, my touring gathered speed. We went to that forgotten creature, the Indian peasant, and remembered that his poverty was the basic problem of India. Sunken eyes glistened, and his shrunken, starved body rose up in enthusiasm, and the wine of hope filled his veins. Changes were taking place in Europe, and Hitler and Nazism had risen. I remember how I reacted to fascism and Nazism in their early days, and not only I, but many in India. How Italy's rape of Abyssinia had sickened us. I remember how I refused a pressing invitation from Signor Mussolini to see him.
how Japanese aggression in China had moved India deeply and revived the age-old friendship for China. In 1938, Congress sent a medical unit consisting of a number of doctors and necessary equipment and materials to China. For several years, this wing did good work there. It is surprising how internationally minded we grew in spite of our intense nationalism. No other nationalist movement of a subject country came anywhere near this. Soon afterwards, a faraway occurrence unconnected with India affected me greatly. This was the news of General Franco's revolt in Spain. I entered into this Europe of conflict by flying straight to Barcelona. But Europe was hardly the place for peaceful contemplation or for light to illumine the dark corners of the mind. It was the Europe of 1938 with Mr. Neville Chamberlain's appeasement in full swing and Nazism marching over the bodies of nations, betrayed and crushed. I remained for five days in Spain and watched the bombs fall nightly from the air. There I saw much else that impressed me powerfully. And there in the midst of want and destruction and ever impending disaster, I felt more at peace with myself than anywhere else in Europe. There was light there, the light of courage and determination of doing something worthwhile. As peace is said to be indivisible in the present world, so also freedom was indivisible. And the world could not continue for long, part free, part unfree. The challenge of fascism and Nazism was in essence the challenge of imperialism. They were twin brothers with this variation, that imperialism functioned abroad in colonies and dependencies, while fascism and Nazism functioned in the same way in the home country also. If freedom was to be established in the world, not only fascism and Nazism had to go, but imperialism had to be completely liquidated. I returned from Europe, sad at heart, with many illusions shattered. In India, the old problems and conflicts continued, and I had to face the old difficulty of how to fit in with my colleagues. Matters came to a head in the Congress at the presidential elections early in 1939. Unfortunately, Maulana Abul Kalam Azad refused to stand and Subhash Chandra Bose was elected after a contest. I have known Subhash for over 20 years. He was not only brave, but had a deep love for freedom. It is an open secret that at times there were differences between us on political questions. He did not approve of any step being taken by the Congress which was anti-Japanese or anti-Italian. And yet such was the feeling in the Congress and the country that he did not oppose this or many other manifestations of Congress sympathy with China and the victims of fascist and Nazi aggression. There was a big difference in outlook between him and the Congress executive, both in regard to foreign and internal matters. One of Subhash's grievances against me, which is coming out more definitely in his correspondences, is his objection to the foreign policy I have sponsored. Gandhiji was not interested in these ideological conflicts, but with his extraordinary capacity to sense the situation, felt that indiscipline was growing rapidly and chaotic forces were being let loose. He was thinking in terms of the great struggle with British imperialism and indiscipline could not be a prelude to this. Subhash Bose resigned from the presidentship and started the forward block. He struggled throughout his life for independence of India, though in his own way. The 
fascist powers would very much like India to be a thorn in the side of England when war comes, so that they might profit by the situation we create. There is nothing that we would dislike so much as to play into the hands of the fascist powers, just as we dislike being exploited by imperialist Britain. Our anti-war policy must therefore be based on freedom and democracy and opposition to fascism and imperialism. And yet with a little twist, it might well be turned into a pro-fascist policy. And I have no doubt that you will give them due consideration. In the first place, I desire to thank you most heartily for the warm and enthusiastic welcome that you have given me on the occasion... Subhash escaped from India, went to Germany and then to Japan. And for the assurance that you have given me of your wholehearted support to our efforts... As for Subhash, I have never doubted his passion for freedom. He had no love for the Japanese, but he imagined that he could further Indian independence by allying himself with the Japanese and Germans, who were not only aggressive powers, but dangerous powers. The story of the Indian National Army, formed in Burma and Malaya during war years, under the leadership of Subhash Chandra Bose, from the abandoned ranks of the British Indian Army, spread suddenly throughout the country and evoked an astonishing enthusiasm. They became the symbols of India fighting for her freedom. They became also the symbol of unity among the various religious groups in India, for Hindu and Muslim and Sikh and Christian were all represented in that army. They had solved the communal problem amongst themselves, and so why should we not do so? <laughs> Munich, 1938. I watched at close quarters the difficult and intricate game of how to betray your friend and the cause you are supposed to stand for on the highest moral grounds. What surprised me most was the utter collapse in the moment of crisis of all the so-called advanced people and groups. Which bears his name upon it as well as mine. The situation in Europe in August 1939 was threatening. England and France had played false to Republican Spain and betrayed Czechoslovakia. War was declared in Europe. April came and the Norwegian debacle. May brought the horrors of Holland and Belgium. June, the sudden collapse of France, and Paris, that proud and fair city, nursery of freedom, lay crushed and fallen. The Viceroy of India announced that India was also at war. One man, and he a foreigner, and a representative of a hated system, could plunge 400 millions of people into war without the slightest reference to them. There was something fundamentally wrong and rotten in a system under which the fate of these millions could be decided in this way. The Congress laid down and frequently repeated a dual policy in regard to war. There was on the one hand opposition to fascism and Nazism. There was intense sympathy with the victims of that aggression. And there was willingness to join in any war or other attempts to stop this aggression. On the other hand, there was an emphasis on the freedom of India, because that was our fundamental objective for which we had continuously labored. We reiterated that only a free India could take proper part in such a war. The British government were bent on ignoring completely Indian opinion. Not even formal or nominal respect was shown to the people's representatives and the declared wishes of the nation. One by one, the Congress resigned and retired from office and provincial autonomy functioned no more. In June 1941, we were stirred by Hitler's sudden attack on Soviet Russia.
Pearl Harbor and what followed it suddenly created a new tension and gave a new perspective. Penang in Singapore, and as the Japanese advanced in Malaya, there was an exodus of Indians and others, and they poured into India. The war ceased to be a distant spectacle and began to approach India and affect her immediately. Gandhiji sponsored a Congress resolution which declared that the primary function of the provisional government of free India would be to throw her great resources in the struggle for freedom and against aggression. Gandhiji was getting on in years. He was in his 70s. And a long life of ceaseless activity, of hard toil, both physical and mental, had enfeebled his body. But he was still vigorous enough, and he felt that all his life work would be in vain if he submitted to circumstances. On 31st May 1942, Mahatma Gandhi stated, I have waited and waited until the country should develop the non-violent strength necessary to throw off the foreign yoke. But my attitude now has undergone a change. I feel that I cannot afford to wait. If I continue to wait, I might have to wait till doomsday. The time has come for us to emphasize and concentrate on complete independence and the total withdrawal of the British power from India. Gandhiji spoke, I will say nothing less than freedom. Here is a mantra, a short one that I give you. The mantra is, do or die. We shall either free India or die in the attempt. We shall not live to see the perpetration of our slavery. On August the 7th and 8th in Bombay, the All India Congress Committee considered and debated the resolution, the Quit India Resolution. The resolution was a reasoned argument for the immediate recognition of Indian freedom. The resolution was finally passed, late in the evening of August the 8th. The reaction in the country was extraordinarily widespread. number of arrests were made in Bombay and all over the country. And so to Ahmadnagar Fort. day we have been here in an internment camp in Ahmadnagar Fort. Non-violence and violence. How we have got into them. It hardly seems possible that we shall ever go back now to our ways and methods of the past 23 years, even if we want to. The war itself breeds in the country against foreign aggressor all methods of violence and at the same time we ask our people to be non-violent in their struggle for national freedom. That was the conflict in the subconscious mind of India. What of Bapu? More than ever before, the responsibility has been his. He knows it, he feels it, and he must suffer for it. Compelled by the feeling of personal responsibility, 
he undertook his 21 days fast. That is over and he has survived. At the same time, it is obvious that he has discharged almost his last weapon. This had big results so far as the people of India were concerned, but not just big enough. The newspapers contained heavily censored news, yet they gave some idea of the war that was consuming more than half the world and of how it fared with our people in India. Then famine came, ghastly, staggering, horrible beyond words. It was the biggest and most devastating famine in India during the past 170 years of British dominion. People dropped down dead before the palaces of Calcutta. Their corpses lay in the mud huts of Bengal's innumerable villages and covered the roads and fields. The famine was a direct result of war conditions and the carelessness and the complete lack of foresight of those in authority. Dear Hindu, thinking of you so often, how little we have been together during these years, especially since 1930. You were a babe in arms when I became entangled in non-cooperation. I was often in prison, and you were first at Pune, and then in Shantiniketan. Later, Switzerland, Bristol, Oxford. During all these years of separation, and thinking of you, you came very close to me. Or rather, the image I made of you became part almost of me. But then, that was a creature of my thought. You were far away. <laughs> 